I'm very, very excited about always being active in the investing space. Is now a good time? Yes, it is. Will you have as many opportunities come up as you did one to two years ago? Probably not, but that's a good thing. It's a good thing to have the deal flow kind of narrow down so you make sure you're still doing really good deals. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. My guest today on Raising Private Money has already raised $20 million in private money. Well, he didn't start out in this world of private money. He actually started his real estate career as a realtor where he was sing, uh, selling single family homes. Actually, he started out in the third most competitive market in the entire country. Well, he was so good at his skill. He was actually able to become a top producer within the second year. And this was at the largest firm in the area. Well, my guest quickly, quickly discovered that as a realtor, you're sort of pretty much working for tips, right? It's all transactional. So he woke up and he realized that there is a difference between being rich and being wealthy. So what did he do? My guest started to look for ways to turn his high transactional income into what really matters for the long term. And what is that? Long term wealth. So he could actually buy back his time and not be trading hours for income, but actually investing for the long term. Well, when he learned about apartment syndications, everything changed. Why did it change? Well, apartment syndications actually provided a truly passive form of real estate investing. Today, he's a passive investor. He's raised millions in private money for apartment syndications. And so his passion today is to share his knowledge in apartment syndications and how that can change your life as well. Well, you're going to meet my guest, Mr. Justin Moy, in just a moment, right after this. Well, first of all, Justin, let's be very clear so everybody knows what we're talking about. What is an apartment syndication? Yeah, absolutely, Jay. So an apartment syndication is a phenomenal way uh, to grow and scale an investment portfolio and to bring in investors who are not in the day-to-day -day of real estate in their personal lives uh, and give them passive opportunities to get into some of these assets. So a syndication is we're essentially buying a big property and instead of coming up with a 25% down payment and 5-10% closing costs and millions of dollars up front uh, from ourselves, we pull in investors and we raise that money you know, $25,000, $50,000 at a time in exchange for equity. So it's a great way for an active investor to grow and scale their portfolio. And it's a fantastic way for people who don't want to commit the time or energy to learning about real estate and to really be active in this game to have truly passive opportunities in the space. Awesome. So you, as I call someone like you, like myself, you're the orchestra director, right? <laughs> yeah, and a great way to put it. You're, you're like, yeah. you're, you're pulling all the, the investors together. You're negotiating the deal. Um, yep. You're putting the deal together. You're raising the money. Mm -hmm. And so, as you say, syndication is a totally passive way that an individual can get involved in real estate investing, but they don't have to go negotiate the deal, create the deal. They can simply no. just sit back and, you know, in, invest and get returns. So really, um, we have here on my podcast, two different audiences for you to speak to. You got one audience, which we have a large audience of real estate investors. Some are very, very seasoned. Some are um, brand new looking at their first deal. And then we have another large part of our audience, which are people like you look forward to invest in your syndication deals that are very interested in real estate, but they want to be totally passive. 
Yeah. Uh, let's let's first speak to uh, our audience, the part the part of our audience that is interested in investing in being a real estate investor, not yeah. passively, but actually raising the money, right? Yep. And then let's speak to the other part of our audience of so someone that's just interested in being totally passive and how that works. So yeah, my, fir my first question on raising private money. So for someone that has never raised private money before, and you've raised 20 million and still raising it. So you've raised a lot of private money. Um, what is like, like your biggest lesson learned or a mistake that you've made in trying to raise or in raising private money before that you would not do again and, and advise someone new that's raising private money? Yeah, I think so much of that uh, that learning curve happens on that first time. Uh, it's a very, very, very common thing that when you're raising for that very first deal, you simply overshoot and overcommit what your true capabilities are. So, you know, a lot of times when we're talking about real estate investing and, you know, I always like to say everybody wants to be a real estate investor. So if you go to your friends and family and your coworkers and everything and you say, you know, hey, I'm doing this really cool thing. I'm raising money for deals. You're going to be a passive investor and we're going to raise for these types of deals and, and the returns are this. Um, everybody says that sounds so cool. Let me know the first time you have a deal. You know, we're in. And those are the famous words. You know, yeah, I'm, I, we're definitely in. Let me know. And then when that first deal comes around, a lot of those people start to fall off because now it's now it's showtime. Um, and so, you know, before if you're doing tallies in your head and okay, I have 10 people who each said they'd really need to give me, you know, 50 grand, I have five hundred thousand dollars to raise. You know, now you can only come to the table with maybe a hundred thousand, maybe, maybe even less. So really, really narrow in exactly how much you think you can raise and don't be afraid to put not fake deals, but preemptive deals in front of your prospective investors to see who is really still gung ho when real deals come around instead of just saying a verbal commitment saying, yes, when you have a deal, that sounds great. Uh, you know, let me know. I'm, I'm definitely interested in investing. So that's, that's the big one that I see a lot of people do is they really take that verbal commitment very seriously. Um, and then when it comes time to pull the trigger and wire some money, they're, they're left with a lot less than, than they thought they could do initially. Yeah, along those lines, that's why I have learned. I've been raising private money since 2009 um, for single family uh, house deals. It's all the same money, whether you're doing apartments or you're doing yeah. single family houses, all the same private money, just structure the deals differently. Mm -hmm. But one big lesson I've learned is when I have a new private lender that says they want to invest, I better be able to put that money to work pretty quickly because yeah. I've I've learned the hard way that private money is sort of like bananas. If you don't consume it pretty quickly, it's going to like go to rot on you and disappear. <laughs> so, you know, you need, you need to put that, put that money to work. Another yeah. thing too is it's uh, for me, Justin, tell me what you think. Raising private money is so much to, of course, you got to know your program. You know what you're, what you're offering, you know, how, you know, being able to explain how you're, investors or your private money lenders are protected. But so much of it for me has to do with mindset. And what I mean by that is I had to get out of my head. I'm not begging. I'm not chasing. I'm not selling. I'm not trying to persuade. I'm actually teaching people what private money is, you know, how they can yeah. actually invest. In, in, and, you know, so my wife, Carol Joy and I, right now, we've got 47 private lenders that are investing in our deals, funding our deals. And you know what, Justin, not one of them, not one of them had ever even heard of private money and private yeah. lending. They didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. So here I am with this mindset of being a teacher and I started teaching people what private money is and uh, how they're protected and, 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 and you know, how, what my, how my program works. And you know, Justin, I tell you one big lesson I learned at the very beginning of raising private money is um, the worst time in the world to be trying to raise private money is when you need it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Pipeline management is is huge. It's huge in this space. Um, you have to always be talking about what you're doing. You have to stay really active and stay in front of, of those prospective investors. Um, and then it's, if you get into that hump, it's exactly like you said. It's an educational platform. You have to go at it from a mindset of education and you have to 
truly, truly, truly love and believe with a thousand percent of your heart and your soul that what you're doing and the deals that you're working on are phenomenal deals. If you doubt even a fraction of a percent, people can tell. You're going to act differently. You're going to give off some signs. You're going to be a little bit nervous. Um, and we've heard this many times that all decisions are made emotionally and justified logically. So even if your investors don't know why they're saying no, they won't even be able to explain it. Because even if logically the deals make sense and you know I like, can trust each other, but there's just a little bit of something there that you're not portraying or that you're hiding a little bit of, um, they're going to be able to tell and you're going to start getting a lot of no's. So total, yeah, totally agree with everything you're saying. You have to be educational and you have to truly, truly, with all your heart and soul, believe in everything that you're doing. And along those lines, Justin, I tell you, you know, if I don't believe in myself and if I don't have confidence in myself, who else is going to? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And people can tell. People can pick up on these things. It's just like if you meet somebody for the first time and you walk away from the conversation, you go, I don't, I don't know. I just for some reason, it doesn't have to be about business. It could be about anything. You could meet a, a friend of a friend and you just walk away. You go, I don't know. I just didn't really like that guy or girl. It's not a logical thing. It's an emotional thing. You just so happen to pick up on something that they were given off or something that they said or a way that they look and your body's picking up on it. So yes, your investors, they will definitely be able to tell you got to have the confidence in yourself and you got to have the confidence in your product. When it comes to teaching potential private lenders, what private money and private lending is, yeah. Another big lesson I've learned, Justin, is if you want to raise a lot of private money for your real estate deals, you better know what self-directed IRA accounts are and yep. how people can transfer retirement money over to a self-directed IRA third-party custodian and lend that money out. The reason that became so important to me uh, is because over half of our 47 private lenders are using their retirement funds. Yeah to invest in our deals. And, you know, if I don't have a, if I didn't have a relationship with a self-directed IRA company, my relationship is with Quest Trust out of Houston, Texas. When I'm teaching somebody about private money and going to raise money, if I don't have that relationship in place with a self-directed IRA company, I'm going to miss out on over half of my funding from people that don't know what this world is about. And I need to be able to introduce them you know, so if, if they're not happy with their retirement funds and, and the rate of return that they're getting, wherever they have them invested, um, then I need to be able to, um, you know, introduce them to who I recommend as a self-directed IRA company. Yeah. You agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so many people do that because before you step into the world of private money, that's what you're taught. You're taught, put your money in these, put them in the 401k and the stock market and your IRAs. Um, and it, it, you know, those aren't bad strategies necessarily, but it's what everybody grows up thinking. So they get a job. That's the first thing they start doing. It's, you know, the 6% of every check goes in there, the 10% of every check with the matches and, and they start stuffing their money in here. And then by the time they start getting more educated and more comfortable with alternative investments and private money, you know, they're looking at this saying, oh my goodness, I have, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe even more stuffed away in these accounts. How can I use those? So yes, you got to be up to date with what's going on uh, legal wise with different accounts, how different people can invest in different strategies um, and stay educated on what's going on with those retirement funds and those accounts from a market perspective. What are average returns looking like? How has the last couple months impacted what their true returns are? How can they look at how their portfolio has actually performed over its lifetime? So you can speak to these things and appear very educated on the topic. Not appear, you should be educated, but you got you to gotta be educated to appear educated on it. So again, taking that educator platform and just telling them exactly what it is and why you're doing what you're doing and why some people like the private money route. And then that's it. It's up to them to make the decision on if that's best for their lifestyle and their portfolio. But you got to be sharp with your education on these topics to truly inform them. Justin, I've got a gift that I want to give away to our audience, uh, those in the audience that are watching or listening that are interested in raising private money for their real estate deals. And that is, I'm so excited. I recently finished writing my new private money guide, which is called seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate business and help you build incredible wealth. 
You can download this private money guide for free at jayconner.com, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money guide. Again, that's jayconner.com, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money guide to get you on the fast track to raising private money for your deals. Justin, let's change gears now and let's speak to those that might be interested in being a totally passive investor, um, a private lender investor without having to find deals, negotiate deals, oversee deals, and just get really, really attractive rates of return totally passively. Well, as you alluded to a moment ago, people grow up, they, they start in corporate America, they, they start doing the 401k and, and they're investing in the stock market. And I have so many people come to me, particularly within the past year, totally fed up, sick and tired with the volatility of the stock market. Mm -hmm. So let me just ask you this question. You know, why can't people really rely on the stock market anymore as a long-term wealth builder in contrast to considering syndication? Yeah, I love the question because um, what a lot of people don't realize, in my opinion, is why the stock market is actually the you know, quote unquote conventional means of investing. Um, the reason why is because earlier on in our, the century, it was it was the big winner. It was the big winner. If you look at the 80s and the 90s, particularly with the stock market, there were you know 20 years within there. I think there were 16 years or 15 years of those 20 where the stock market posted double digit gains, double digit gain. I think it was 15 out of the 20 years and it only lost, I think one or two of those years. And since the nineties, it has just been extremely volatile. Um, if you're looking at indexes now, part of the reason why that is, is because of the companies that make up things like the S and P 500, um, where we're now switching to more volatile tech companies as opposed to more stable, you know, manufacturing companies in the past. So the volatility has really, really kicked up and what people don't realize is with the stock market, even if you've been investing in indexes since the sixties on a consistent basis, your average rate of return is between six and 8%, not including inflation, not including taxes, not including if you have anybody managing your portfolio for fees. So I think a lot of people, when they realize that and they take a step back and look at their portfolio on the public sector, they're going to be extraordinarily surprised that their money wasn't really working as hard as it could be um, in terms of private money investments where you know, we're seeing high double digit returns on a pretty consistent and conservative basis. So the public markets, you know, they used to be slam dunk home runs almost all the time, but those times have really changed and we're seeing the average returns really get impacted negatively by that. Justin, let me give you an example of the stock market not performing. My mother, who is 88 years old, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I get a copy in the mail of her stock market investments. They've only dropped 22% in value in the past 90 days, in the past 90 days, yeah. right? So, you know, and then, you know, my wife, Carol Joy and I, we get thank you notes in the mail as to how we have changed their retirement years yeah. from our private lenders, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking, speaking of the... Um, Speaking of the risk, so obviously there's big time risk in the stock market. What are the biggest risks in investing in syndication? Yeah. And and I would love to do that. And just to step back one one moment, like you said, you know, you're looking at your mother's portfolio. Uh, my mother actually couldn't retire. Um, she had to put off retirement for another couple of years because the her portfolio, she was really depending on that. And then of course times hit us hard and, and now she had to push that back. So, so I, I totally agree. It's really starting to impact a lot of people. Um, and when you talk about the risk of private versus public investments in the private sector, specifically with syndications is you really are making a passive investment in an operator. So we're operators, operators are kind of the active partners in the deal. Um, that's where a ton of your work comes into play because once you make the investment, you are truly passive. So you're truly passive. There is zero time, energy, or knowledge commitment needed on your part. 
But what you really have to do is do a lot of due diligence up front on the operators and who's going to be managing your money. So that could be a pro or a con, depending on, on who you are and, and how your ability to really research these things and get to know these people. Um, but you have a lot of control in that sense because you're not just putting your money out into you know, the markets uh, and, and hoping that that takes care of things. You have control over who you invest with. But of course, that could be a risk if you don't do proper due diligence, if you don't really know who you're investing with, um, if you pull the trigger on, on somebody who maybe talks the talk but isn't able to walk the walk on the back end. Um, so the biggest risk is going to be in the operator that you invest in, and that's where people need to focus a lot of their time doing a lot of their due diligence. So what you're saying, Justin, is the biggest risk of a private lender uh, investing in syndication is who's running the show? Who's running it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who's running it? Um, and you know, there's a lot of ways to mitigate risk, and and markets are important, and asset types are important, and historical financials are important. Um, but you really have to invest with somebody again who you believe in, who you believe in, who you who you begin to know, like, and trust. And don't invest with the first person you meet, um, even if they they sound good and they're they're say all the right things. Um, you want to follow them in their journey for a little bit of time. So really knowing who you're dealing with, um, who this person is, how's their company structured? Is it a big operation or a small operation? Neither is better or worse than the other. They're just different styles. What's the communication style going forward? Because unlike the stock markets, you should expect regular communication on, on the assets you invested in, how they're performing, what's the good, bad, and the ugly. What are some of the obstacles that we've overcome this month? So you're going to get a lot of those communications. You're going to be really married for the, the couple of years that the investment is, is in there. Um, so really make sure that you're getting in bed with somebody you're comfortable with. Well, that triggers a good question. Uh, about how long is the private lender investing in a syndication and, and going to, you know, more or less have their investment capital or their and or their retirement funds, quote unquote, tied up uh, to where they wouldn't have access to it? Yeah, I would say most syndications are going to have about a three to five year timeline on them for some type of event, whether that's a refinance with cash being pulled out or a sale, um, depending on the business strategy. Now, there's different syndications. You can do shorter term ones that are quicker flips, or you can do you know maybe a year and a half or two years, and a lot of your return is on that back end on that sale. Or you could have something that's more stable where they're saying, yeah, we're going to hold this thing for 15 years and refinance it every five, but our cash flow is going to be this. And then when you get your money back from refinances, your returns will be this. So there's different strategies that you can explore a lot of if you want to do heavy cash flow for longer term plays, or if you want to do very quick uh, transactional properties, you know, the, there'll be operators that serve all of those niches. Is now a good time to be uh, for someone to consider investing in syndication, um, given the current climate. <clears throat> well, first of all, how would you describe the current climate uh, yeah. of uh, real estate as far as, you know, apartments and et cetera? And then the follow up question to that would be is, is now a good time or is now not a good time? Yeah. The way I would describe the environment now is exciting. It's exciting to be an investor. Um, what it's not exciting for are the people who have to exit their loans right now. That's going to propose some challenges. Um, now luckily, we have had some safety measures with our properties that we won't be put in any of those tight spots, but some operators will. And because of that, it's exciting for the buyers. It's, it's exciting for the people who are looking to continue to invest and who have long-term strategies in hold and long-term fail-safes in hold. Uh, fail safes with their business models of their investing. So I'm excited uh, for this upcoming year or two years as a, as a buyer, and we're able to hold off a lot of our sales um, to really wait for the markets to adjust. So is now a good time? I, I, I'm very, very excited about always being active in the investing space. Is now a good time? Yes, it is. Will you have as many opportunities come up as you did one to two years ago? Probably not, but that's a good thing. It's a good thing to have the deal flow kind of narrow down so you make sure you're still doing really good deals. So it's still an exciting time to invest. And just with real estate, just like anybody who invests in anything, they'll always tell you, well, I wish I started sooner.
So it's always a good time. Your strategy, your strategies just might change. Um, and the amount of deals that you do would likely change, but you're always got to keep your eyes open for good deals. Justin, I know we have got a lot of people listening that are interested in learning more about how they could do business with you or invest with you. They want to learn, um, well, what kind of returns can I get, right? I mean, like right yeah. now, we know it's pathetic in the local bank or credit union on the 12-month certificate of deposit yield. Yeah. Um, most people are looking to get a higher rate of return. So how can people get in contact with you? and learn about the high rates of return and return on investment they can get by doing business with Justin Moy and his team. Yeah, the, the absolute best place is going to be to download our free ebook. It's at thedefinitiveguidebook.com. It's called The Definitive Guide to Passive Real Estate Strategies. It should answer all of your questions about passive real estate investing and the strategies that are within this niche. Um, discuss returns, discuss the steps into getting involved, getting started. And then throughout there, my contact information is all over the book. Um, and you'll get some communication from me after that when the book is delivered uh, on ways to get in touch with me as well. So it's thedefinitiveguidebook.com. That's going to be the absolute best resource for you. Excellent. Well, there you have it, my friends. <clears throat> Download Justin's free book at www.thedefinitiveguidebook.com. And that will get you on the path to learning about being a passive investor. Justin, thank you so much for taking the time to join me on Raising Private Money. Jay, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. I appreciate everybody's time here as well. You got it. Well, there you have it, my friend, another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority, and I need your help. I really appreciate the uh, shares and the likes, and uh, if you are watching on YouTube by chance, be sure and click that bell so you don't miss out on our upcoming episodes of Raising Private Money. And uh, if you happen to be listening on iTunes or Spotify, be sure and follow me. Look forward to having you join us here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Here's to taking your business to the next level, and we'll see you right here on the next Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money. Money.